kickoff webinar. We're very excited to have you all here. Um, I think a few registrants are still joining, um, but we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Carly Hood. I'm OPCA's Policy Associate. Um, I'll be presenting the bulk of today's webinar, but I'm joined with Elizabeth Kwasnick, who is our Manager of Grassroots Advocacy at NAC. Um, the national level, we're very excited to have her here. Um, in addition to Jamie Letter and Serena Cruz, who are joining us from Virginia Garcia, um, to highlight the important work that they're starting um, with regards to advocacy. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, just before we start, a few housekeeping items. We're going to mute everyone during the presentation. And we'll open it up at the end during our 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A session. But if you have questions that come up during the presentation, please feel free to put those in the chat box. And we'll try to answer them during the presentation. Um, because you're muted, um, we, we have a little, I think you can see in the chat box, we put this in there as well. But um, press star 6 to mute or unmute. So, um, we'll unmute you at the end, but we have so many people on this webinar that we want to make sure and uh, keep it quiet, so we've muted all of you. But um, you have that option, that star six, if you hear uh, yourself typing, um, go ahead and mute yourself. We also have controls here, so if we hear any noise, we'll, we'll mute it as well. Um, and then if you're having any audio trouble, there are a few options. You can log off and then try to join again. Um, you can also try selecting a different listening option, and you can also chat us if you're having any issues. And then there's also a link um, through Citrix you can visit if you're having issues. And we've put all this information in the chat box for you to access as well. And just a note that we will be recording this, and so we'll have slides and a recording available after the presentation. Great. Thanks, Ursula. All right. So to go ahead and get started, um, today's agenda, I'm going to touch very lightly on why advocacy matters and its um, value. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir with this audience, but I think it's important to get us all on the same page. Um, I'll share a little bit about OPCA's strategic advocacy plan. Um, we've developed one at a very high level and shared with our board of directors, um, with our policy committee, and we want to share it with all of you as well. Um, we'll talk about NAC's ACE program or ACE Centers of Excellence program, um, and that will be the way that you at a clinic level can engage in advocacy and develop a plan of your own. Um, and then I'm excited to have both NAC and Virginia Garcia join me on the phone um, to talk about advocacy um, at the federal level and in addition to um, uh, at the clinic level as it's already occurring. As Rivkula mentioned, we'll have um, about 10 to 15 minutes for questions, so write those down um, and, and we'll get started. So the what and why, what is advocacy? Um, again, I'm sure this is very familiar to you, but advocacy encompasses many activities and is in fact a huge body of work. Um, activities that fall under the umbrella of advocacy might include sitting face to face with policymakers or legislators, um, educating the public on the value of your community health center, acting on work groups or committees um, that move the work of your organization forward, and or holding events um, that share all of the value of the work that you do. 95% of your outreach and engagement efforts are probably considered advocacy or engagement, um, whether you knew that or not. And legislative advocacy, despite what people might think, is really the smallest fraction of advocacy when we think about the big umbrella of what this body of work is. Advocacy in all of its forms is a process um, that enables people to express views, uh, to access information and services, promote their rights, and explore choices and options. It seeks to ensure that people, particularly the most vulnerable in our society, are able to have their voices heard and defend their rights. So it's very critical in the community health center context. And then if you take nothing away but this today, I hope um, that we can all agree that advocacy is a larger strategy um, that really ensures, in this case, the work and need for health centers is brought to the attention of decision makers and policymakers. 
Um, and that, again, occurs through talking to legislators, sharing with the public, um, really communicating the value of what you do. So we know that health is impacted by many, many things. Um, what I wanted to emphasize with this graphic is how research continues to show that 40% of health outcomes are driven by social and economic factors and 10% by our physical environment. And some might actually dispute that this is a higher percent now. Um, but at a minimum, this means that at least half of health outcomes are driven by what we call the social determinants of health. Um, and this includes things like poverty, housing, education, our built environment, et cetera. So again, this material probably isn't new for you either, but I think it's really critical and foundational um, for us to understand our common mission of working towards health equity and how essential advocacy is in really getting us um, to move that direction. Why primary care, some might ask. Um, several reasons. First, a recent report out of Portland State University um, here indicates that for every dollar spent on primary care, $13 in other services such as specialty care and emergency department utilization are saved. That's a 13 to 1 investment, which is huge. Second, a recent report showed that four in five physicians believe that things like a lack of access to nutritious food, um, transportation, and housing assistance are leading to worse health among Americans. Yet, four in five physicians also feel unable to address their patient's health concerns that are caused by these unmet social needs. This same report um, that's referenced on the bottom of the screen also indicated physicians agree their patient's health is impacted by social needs beyond their control, um, and that impedes their ability to provide quality care. So again, the fact that these bigger issues are complicating um, providing care to patients uh, begs the case for us to really pay attention to advocacy as well. So what can providers do? Um, there are a lot of resources that show, uh, that point to what primary care and providers can do in the realm of social determinants of health. Many of you are probably actively engaged um, in some of this work with um, us at OPCA and other organizations. On a patient level, this includes everything from screening for social determinants of health um, to linking patients with resources. But what I want to point out is that at a population level, advocacy is also essential in this area. Um, providers hold a particular amount of clout, and people listen when they speak, um, especially decision makers. So convincing policymakers that health is bigger than healthcare is something that clinicians can do particularly powerfully um, and something we hope to be able to help you with. And then why community health centers? Um, Community health centers serve patients in every legislative district and have great bipartisan relationships across the aisle. Over 420,000 patients receive care at a local community health center in Oregon, including one in four uh, patients on the Oregon Health Plan. So you all are serving some of the most vulnerable in our community. Health centers also can tell the story of the real world impact um, of policy. So really being able to bring policy down to the ground level. Um, you all serve the patients, see the patients every day, know the stories, um, and that's, that's critical to being able to um, advocate for your patients. And then lastly, um, you all as a network of community health centers and us at the, the state level are part of multiple coalitions and groups um, that really increase our reach and our advocacy at a, at a state level. So this year, um, in partnership with NAC, who you'll hear from in a bit, we're kicking off um, a more structured advocacy plan to really help you implement this at your clinic. Our advocacy plan at a high level, um, at the state level, focuses in three main areas. First, on the far left, we want to be able to provide support and technical assistance with regards to advocacy. So that might mean um, training, uh, monthly webinars, resources that make it very easy for you to advocate, and peer learning so that you can learn from clinics that are doing it well and help clinics that are, are struggling in this area. Um, the second kind of bucket of work, um, and again, this is probably the smallest piece of advocacy despite what, what we think when we hear the word advocacy, um, is connecting you with your policymakers. So we want to be able to help facilitate that connection, get legislators into your clinics, 
um, share the data about the great work that you're doing with your legislators and your local elected officials. Um, and then lastly, support you all as health center staff on um, work groups or committees that are effectively implementing policy. So again, really bringing that down to the ground level. And finally, um, the last bucket of work on the right is communication. So we want to be able to provide um, templates and uh, resources and examples of strong communication, not just for legislators, but for the public as well, that communicate your stories. So through the ACE program, which I'll talk about in just a moment, um, we hope you at the clinic level are able to develop mirroring advocacy plans um, that fit into our larger initiative, so we're really creating a grassroots movement. Um, your advocacy plan might look like what's on the screen, it might not, um, but again, we ideally hope that you're able to participate in these peer learning um, opportunities and the resources that we create, um, engage with your policymakers effectively, and then share your stories so that we have kind of a bucket of stories we can share at the local, state, and federal level. Um, we've had, I just wanted to touch on this briefly, um, we have had two legislative advocacy days this year that have gone well. Um, our first was the day at the Capitol in Salem. On March 21st, um, 45 attendees representing 18 health centers went down to Salem, so that's over half of our health centers across the state. It was an, an amazing group. Um, we met with 42 legislators that day and heard from four speakers. And then similarly, at the national level, um, we had folks attend our Hill visits with lawmakers on March 30th um, in conjunction with the policy, um, policy uh, conference that NAC put on. So we had 19 attendees representing 10 health centers. That's by far the largest we've had at the federal level. Um, and we met with all seven of our congressional delegation or their staff. Um, and these were some great conversations. We had a wonderful um, opportunity to kind of engage with them, learn more about the issues happening on the Hill, um, and then frankly be able to come back and say, hey, I either met with you in Salem or I met with you in D.C. Please come visit our health center. It's a really good hook to get folks back um, to your clinic. So I have now said ACE about 100 times, um, and you're probably all wondering, what is the ACE program? Um, so let's learn a little bit more about that, and then we'll have um, Elizabeth, who's on the phone, kind of dive in. And you're muted, Elizabeth, but please underscore or remove anything that I say wrong when you get to your opportunity to share. Um, so what is an ACE? An Advocacy Center of Excellence, or ACE, is a health center that's achieved uh, certain advocacy goals and has demonstrated an ongoing commitment to advocacy by making it an organizational priority. Um, in addition to creating, you know, a, a culture of advocacy within your health center, um, ACEs are actively engaged and involved with NAC at the federal level and with us at the Primary Care Association at the state level um, on key issues uh, that we all need to move forward. There are three levels of ACE. There's a bronze, a silver, and a gold level. Um, each designation, once achieved, is valid for two years. And so far, by what I could find, again, Elizabeth will have to correct me if I'm wrong, so far nationally there are 13 gold aces, 11 silver, and 28 bronze, but none of those are in Oregon yet. So why use this model? Um, in a minute I'll kind of dive into the specifics of the ACE model and how it's helpful. Um, but many of you are likely already doing many of the activities that would would achieve this designation for you. Um, there are several reasons that this designation is more than just a recognition or medal, and I really want to call those out. Um, the first is that it provides a simple structure to enhance communication and streamline calls to action quickly. So when we need to move as a state um, on, on a particular issue, either at the state or federal level, having this structure in place becomes that much more easy for us to move quickly. Second, it creates a framework to prioritize advocacy as an organizational goal, um, which ultimately increases funding, innovation, and your ability to serve patients. So really making this a strategic uh, priority is part of the ACE model. Third, it saves work for staff in the long run. Um, 
So we like to say go slow to go fast. Um, setting up this structure, making sure that we kind of have um, designated folks who are owning parts of it, uh, strategic goals that we're checking off, really allows us, again, to move quickly when we need to. Fourth, it coordinates our work across the state, creating more of a, a true grassroots movement when we need it. And then last, it, it allows you to learn from others who are doing well and or support clinics um, who are newly emerging in this area. So there are four areas of work that health centers, um, that allow health centers to move advocacy forward. And I've listed these as steps because I think they build on one another. Um, you could probably do one or all of them um, without the others, but I'll walk through them as steps. Um, and the first is making advocacy an organizational priority. So this includes engaging the board and staff, developing goals that fit into a strategic plan, um, and charging staff members, not just frontline or management staff, but leadership as well, um, to oversee completion of these goals. So our, I can say the Primary Care Association Board has definitely committed to advocacy. It's a standing agenda item on our board meetings. Um, there's many of the strategic goals kind of tie directly to advocacy and this ACE program. So um, that at a high level is, is really prioritizing this and making it an organizational priority. I had conversations um, with several other primary care associations across the country who are doing this well, um, and they suggested that adding advocacy as a standing agenda item to staff and board meetings is a really critical piece um, to ensuring that it's revisited, that people know what's going on. Um, so that, that's pretty key to this step. Step two is to operationalize advocacy. So this means turning those goals into action items. Um, it might include, again, clinic leadership, not just frontline staff paving the way by modeling this commitment to advocacy, um, engaging staff and providing training for a space to learn more, responding to calls to action. So for example, last week we sent out um, a letter that we are asking clinics to sign on to for our senators with regard to the American Health Care Act. Um, and we have 23 of our 32 health centers signed on, which is fantastic. Um, but again, really getting everyone engaged quickly and easily would make this um, more of an operationalized priority. Um, and then using technology more efficiently. So in this day and age, this piece is critical. Um, it might mean developing a new social media platform or really using one that exists, um, but thinking through how to engage folks through social media is important as well. Step three is engaging the community. Um, and for some, this might be relatively easy. For others, it's more difficult. Um, but it means really thinking about the resources that you have in your community, who in your community is an influence or influencer or a leader, um, and who are the decision makers. So really targeting some of your communication tactics at those people who um, are making key decisions and influencing others. Um, this is a great opportunity for myself and other OPCA staff to work with you to identify and kind of map out what your community looks like, um, including media, your elected officials, et cetera. And I'll say also, um, this step is, is critical for us being able to support you at a local level. So much of the ACE work starts kind of um, with state and federal issues, but eventually we want to be able to support you with issues that you want to work on at a local level as well. Um, and this step would be very important to that. And the final step is thinking about how to celebrate and communicate your wins um, throughout the year. So one big potential for this is National Health Center Week. Um, this week is August 13th through 19th. This is a great time, like I said, to, to revisit that you sat with a legislator, invite them to come visit your health center. Um, but not just le legislators, the public as well. You want folks in your community to know the value um, of what you do. So I won't spend a ton of time on each level of achievement. I mentioned there's bronze, silver, and gold. Um, we can discuss more about where you're at, what you feel comfortable trying to achieve at a clinic level, um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but I did just want to run through quickly um, what NAC has laid out as um, effective achievement of the bronze level. So this would mean establishing an advocacy, advocacy committee 
work group or designating one staff person as a coordinator within your, um, within your health center. So who is that person? Really calling that out. Having an advocacy work plan in place. Um, and again, we're here to support you in developing that, but making that plan available to your staff, to your board, so folks know um, this is something that we're committed to. Um, I mentioned incorporating advocacy and policy at staff and board meetings. That, that's pretty critical, and we heard that loud and clear from other PCAs. Passing a board resolution. Um, so, you know, your board recognizing this is something we're committed to and, and writing it up. Registering 50% of your staff and your board as health center advocates, um, and that's a, a fairly simple one to check off um, just by logging on to our website or NAC's website and signing up to receive alerts. Um, you take care of that piece. Hosting one National Health Center Week event, um, and this can take shape in a lot of different ways. It doesn't have to be a, a super serious event. Um, but if you're considering or thinking about it, I'll put a plug right now for our June 15th planning call, um, and I'll have that up on the screen at the end. Um, this is a good chance to really plan and network with folks across the state. And then host an elected official. So that could be local, state, or federal, um, but you want to host one annually at your health center, and that could be in conjunction with the, North, uh, the National Health Center Week. Those two things could be checked off at the same time. And then the last achievement would be to establish a social media account um, in the name of your health center. So the silver achievements just move up from there. Um, you know, you have to engage a few more staff um, and board as advocates, have more elected officials visit your health center, um, provide a couple of trainings. And all of this, both NAC and OPCA are very um, excited and willing to support you on. Um, we just have to figure out which level you want to achieve. And then gold just moves up a little bit from there as well. So to put a, a plug in for NAC, um, and Elizabeth might mention this as well, but if you become an ace at any level, bronze, silver, or gold, by the end of July, you'll be entered to win um, one of the following, either registration at, a, at the CHI and Expo conference, um, or attendance at the Advocacy Leadership Program session, and I believe there's one at PNI next year, and there's one at CHI this year. So, Cool opportunities to get recognized um, and have registration for events paid for too. Our goal um, at the PCA level is to have 50% of our clinics achieving bronze by the end of the year. All right, and with that, I'm going to unmute Jamie and Serena. So um, actually, Jamie and Serena, if you could press star six to unmute yourself. I, I just unmuted myself. Is, is uh, Jamie on? I am. Great. Take it away. OK. So I'm Jamie Letter. I am the Quality Assurance Manager for Virginia Garcia Memorial Health Center. And um, I was asked to kind of give an overview of how we launched our um, advocacy program. We're not anywhere near done, but we're working on it. Um, so um, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so the first thing that we did um, was we needed to get um, buy-in from the executive team and the board of directors. So there was a presentation where we explained um, what the requirements are and why we're doing this. And so the board passed a resolution um, to make this an organizational commitment. And then um, we had to incorporate advocacy into our strategic plan. Um, so Serena um, was probably the, um, the person who was advocating for that in the executive team. Um, but we've already done that. And then um, the next thing we did was um, develop a steering committee. Um, we decided to have a manager from each department as a representative on the steering committee. Um, so that's, you see all of the kind of departments and roles here. Um, and then later we would like to form action committees um, at each site. So really getting the staff more involved. 
And our staff is really passionate, um, you know, about advocacy um, because at our clinic in particular, we serve a lot of undocumented folks. So advocacy in terms of immigration status was an important piece of our program because many of the programs that support undocumented patients may go away if funding is cut. Um, so our staff being passionate about the issue, we knew that our action committees would have no shortage of volunteers. Next slide. Okay, and then we created a charter to make sure that everyone on the steering committee um, agrees and is working towards a common goal. Um, if you do want to see that, you can reach out to OPCA um, and they'll get in touch with me and I can send that. And then we also created um, a work plan. We used the sample from NAC to establish deadlines. And then Serena created a dashboard to delegate specific tasks. And um, yes, the, the work plan was the sample from NAC, so we really, you know, just pretty much followed along with their pre-established work plan. And the, the dashboard, if you want to see that too, you're welcome to reach out and ask about that. So from the dashboard, um, we broke up into subcommittees uh, to tackle things like policies, training, communication, and immigration-specific advocacy. And communication was uh, a really important part of our program, so we created a protocol for what our response would be if ICE were to show up tomorrow, <laughs> and um, we're rolling that out. We know that right now that clinics are kind of like a, a protected atmosphere where ICE, are, ICE agents aren't allowed um, to be on the property as of now, but it seems like with this administration, things change really quickly, so we wanted to be proactive in case something does change. Um, we also created, we have an internal newsletter, so we created a standing column in that internal newsletter. And then we have um, a public relations officer um, that started sending, out, um, sending calls to action to all employees to call and write legislators on issues related to CHC funding. And because undocumented immigrants are a large part of our patient population, a lot of questions had already come up um, about, you know, if I were to show up, what can I do, what can I do? Um, and so we wanted to make sure risk management-wise that, you know, that, that our employees weren't going to say or do something that would get us in trouble or jeopardize our funding. Okay. Um, and so when we came up with this um, response plan, we did have an attorney vet that, an immigration attorney vet that, so um, that we would be sure that we're, everything we're telling them is legal. <laughs> um, next slide. Okay, then implementing the plan. Um, we've made advocacy a standing agenda, agenda item on all of the important meetings, like our board meeting, executive team meeting, um, quality improvement, operations, um, and that's really helpful too. Um, even if I don't have anything to bring to the table, um, I'll ask, and usually there's something that comes up. Um, and then we did the statement of nonpartisanship using the NAC template. And um, we already have social media sites for our clinic. Um, and we, we already have a social media policy. Um, so this was just a matter of um, revising the policy to give direction to employees for using, our, using their own social media accounts to advocate. Um, so we, we want them to advocate using social media, but we also wanted to make it clear that employees cannot represent their own opinion as that of our clinic. Um, so we don't want them saying things like, I work at Virginia Garcia and we believe and then, you know, putting their own opinion out there. Um, so any time that they're posting about Virginia Garcia with regard to advocacy, we'll have approved, mes approved messages for them to post. Otherwise, you know, we expect them to make it very clear that it's their opinion. 
and then um, we also weren't sure what to do as far as onboarding and you know we didn't want to miss anything important so we thought we would reach out to clinics who have already achieved bronze and silver level status um, and ask them what they did for the onboarding requirement. Um, so I just started getting you know, some of their presentations. Um, and they're really good, so I think um, I can probably use that as a template and then make it our own. Um, and then our next steps are to roll out the ICE response protocol. Um, and then we've got to create action committees, um, you know, at each site for each department. And then, you know, develop the advocacy training plan. And we, we have yet to do, you know, registering and, and, um, employees as advocates. Um, and of course, we plan to engage patients, community, media. And I believe the foundation is already working on planning a National Health Center Week. So that's about it. Um, you're welcome to ask any questions. So let's, that was fantastic. Thank you, Jamie and Serena for being on the call. Um, let's move into, I want to make sure Elizabeth Kwasnick, who's joining us um, from DC, um, has a chance to present. But hold your questions for Virginia Garcia. I have a, a feeling you guys are going to be a great example for other clinics. Thank you. All right, Elizabeth. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Great, great. Well, thanks so much for having me on the call today, and thanks everybody for being on. I think half of the battle sometimes is just showing up in terms of advocacy, so you've already made that commitment, and I want to thank you for that. Um, next slide. Just want to underscore a little bit of what Carly said. She did a really fantastic job of explaining that advocacy really is more than just emailing and calling your members of Congress. I know sometimes it feels like that's all that NAC asks you to do, and you can check those boxes, and you know you've done everything we've asked. Um, but as Jamie and Serena just described with their work on immigration, that's a perfect example of how advocacy is so much more than just reaching out to. Um, your legislators. It's really, it's, it's responding to community needs. And I know one of their slides said that staff were personally interested in advocating and in getting involved. And I think once you have that passion, you really can't go wrong with, with engaging people where they want to be engaged. So why advocacy? I think the next couple of slides are really just going to sort of reinforce what's already been said. It's the best way to tell your story. And that is what you're an expert on. Nobody respects you at the you know at the policymaker level to be an expert on Medicaid or to be an expert on immigration or be an expert on health center funding. What you are an expert on is your health center and your personal story, and that's really all that advocacy is. It's telling that story. How did you get involved? Um, you know, data is great, but if you don't have those patient stories and the human element, you know, you're really not going to be tugging at anybody's heartstrings with you know data and numbers. Um, so it is personal. It's about you and about the patient. Next slide. So just a couple of, of bullets. I, we get asked all the time, you know, why does this even matter? Do people read my emails? You know, are, you know does my call even count? Um, why should I even bother? Well, here are four great reasons. If you can't think of anything else, use these when you get that question yourself. Um, because there, there's so much turmoil right now and, and so many unanswered questions, and health centers can and should be part of the solution for those challenges that we're facing right now. Um, we are still one of those very, very few things that have bipartisan support. Um, if you know, MACRA from 2015 is any indication, and we are still riding that wave of bipartisan support. Um, because we serve more than 25 million patients nationally, and many of those, many of them would have nowhere else to go if your clinic or health center ceased to exist. Um, and because we have now over 130, we're closing in on 140,000 advocates um, in the NAC grassroots advocacy network. And we need as many of those 130 plus thousand people to take action. Um, and there really just is too much at risk right now not to advocate. Next slide. So Carly talked a little bit about building that culture of advocacy, and that's really what we mean when we talk about taking advocacy to the next level. 
it's more than just you know spending five minutes and sending that email or making that phone call. Um, we really do have to build it into everything that we do, which I think is why folks have found um, adding advocacy as a standing agenda item, for example, to be a really, really helpful and useful activity. Um, and so I'm not going to read through all of these words. It's a very busy slide. But building that culture of advocacy really means incorporating it as a part of everything that you do um, and really making it a part of the overall excellence conversation that folks apply to, you know, clinical measures and other administrative, um, you know, quality measures and things like that. Next slide. So thinking about the ACE program, I'm, Carly did a great job of describing all of the things that go into that. I just really wanted to touch on some of the reasons why we launched that program and, and you know, what we see as the intention for it. Um, as I said, health center initiatives are focused on operational excellence, so why can't we add advocacy to that conversation? Um, advocacy is important to keeping, you know, keeping the lights on, keeping the doors open, keeping those patients um, you know, confident in their coverage and in their access to care. So we need to make sure that advocacy is a top priority. Um, the ACE program does establish a standardized framework, as Carly said, um, and demonstrates the organization's commitment to advocacy. And one thing I will say is um, if you're not at a place where you can complete all of the eight steps of bronze or if you're not, you know, thinking that you might want to go for silver or gold, do what you can. You don't have to be an ACE. And I think I really like the go slow to go fast analogy. I usually say for ACE, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, if you're only at a place right now where you can check off four of those eight boxes, no rush. There's no deadline for applying to the ACE program. Um, and if, in general, it's not something that you feel you can do, then, then do what you can and get advocacy going, you know, anyway. Um, the other thing I will mention is that even though your status, once you are approved, is valid for two years, there's no barrier to moving up. So if you start at bronze, you don't have to wait two years to hit silver and then two more years to hit gold. If you can achieve those next levels in the next six months, eight months, go for it. Um, it's just if you, if you do nothing else, it will be valid for two years. Um, and I think it's, the ACE program is a little bit easier to, um, to achieve than sort of just amorphously putting together an advocacy program just because it does include those clear goals and has um, some progress measures like that 50% sign up and the 10% response rate in um, the silver level and uh, the recognition for achieving that excellence. Um, I think the other thing I really want to mention is, and I think Virginia Garcia does this really well, is that they made it work for them. Uh, this we, we really wanted ACE to be more of a framework and not incredibly prescriptive so that you felt you didn't have any room for creativity or innovation. Um, and I think if one of the first slides um, that Serena and Jamie went over had mention of that they have representation from the medical clinic and the dental clinic. And in preparation for this call, we had a chance to talk. And they had said, well, we really wanted to get everybody involved, but it just wasn't going to work out because you know people have full-time jobs and full plates. Um, so they do have representation from those um, different departments and clinics, and I think that's great. If, you know, if you if it doesn't work for you to have everybody involved, then do a work group. If it works for you to have one person doing ACE or doing advocacy, then do that. Um, really make it your own and make it local. And I think that's probably the biggest takeaway that I would have for you today. Um, but thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Great, thanks, Elizabeth. So before we open it up for questions, I'm just going to quickly run through the wrap-up, and then we'll have the rest of the time, um, 15 minutes, to kind of hear from you guys. So two big takeaways, um, best practices I heard from other health centers and PCAs around the country, um, appoint an advocacy leader or a committee, a work group um, within your health center. Let me know, Carly, or let OPCA know who that is so we can work directly with that person to streamline advocacy activities. Um, the second is to get leadership buy-in. Um, so really getting leadership to commit to advocacy, having a resolution, um, a standing agenda item on board and staff meetings as you've heard. 
So the next step, set up a, a planning meeting or shoot me an email or call me if you want to talk a little bit more about where you're at, what you think might be achievable within the advocacy framework. Um, National Health Center Week is fastly approaching, and we do want to try to get everyone to plan some sort of event with our support. So um, I've got the registration link up there. I'll email it out after as well. Um, please plan to have someone on the call June 15th, and let OPCA know if you're planning, um, planning to host an event. And then we will be hosting monthly advocacy webinars. So again, letting me know who that kind of point person or, or committee folks are within your health center will allow me to share invites with the, uh, those people. All right. So we will open it up to questions. And, and we've gone ahead, ahead and unmuted everyone, but if you're um, still muted, just press star six so that we can go ahead and hear you. Don't all talk at once. <laughs> I'll start. This is Ermit OPCA. Um, Carly, what is going to happen on the monthly um, advocacy webinar call? Glad you asked, Irma. Um, we will be sending out a survey with this webinar at the end to ask folks what advocacy tools and resources they want more of. Um, so it might be everything from collecting stories, sharing your stories, to developing a social media account, um, anything that folks within the clinic feel like they need training on. Thank you. Other questions, concerns? This is Christine. I work with the um, Community Health Centers down in Benton and Lynn County. And I had typed just a comment into the box, the chat box, that we started looking at the NAC ACE program. And um, the grassroots orientation became a little bit problematic for us because we're government. And so we have used it as guidance. And our board has adopted a resolution. And we've done a campaign within our clinics advocating a safe space message and oriented our staff to the fact that our mission is very much in line with what we um, want to promote in terms of advocacy. But we do find that we come up against some barriers, and those are vetted through our legal folks, um, about what we can do in terms of asking people to respond to calls to action and things like that. So just throw that out there as um, maybe just something to be aware of as different organizations are going down this path. And I think it, towards the end, somebody said, do what you can. And I think that's what we've done. But we really like the ACE layout and then just found that it might not be the best model for us. Christine, thank you for sharing that. You're not the first to, uh, person working in a governmental institute to say it's a little bit different for us. Um, and we have talked around the idea of potentially setting up a space for you all who are working in that slightly different environment to um, share best practices based on um, things being slightly different for you. Um, I will say also I believe there's some flexibility with NAC, and Elizabeth could probably speak better to this. Um, but for us to kind of make sure that our, our ACE framework works with you. It sounds like you guys have done quite a lot already, um, yeah. and we wouldn't want you to feel like you're not achieving certain statuses based on all that great work. So, Right. Yeah, so that would be a, a nice way just to think about um, that rec recognition or whatever you are trying to build in terms of best practices. I think we have something to contribute, but we may not be able to reach a level that gets, you know, that check box which is fine with us, but I just want to share that with you so that you get to, we all benefit from that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this is Elizabeth. You are, ditto Carly, you are certainly not the first um, mm -hmm. folks to bring this up to us, but I would be more than happy to, to chat offline and make something work for you. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other burning questions?
Okay. Well, if that's it, we will wrap up for today. I will send the recording and the slides out to folks. Um, please reach out to me if you're interested in starting to talk about the ACE level or um, kind of advocacy activities happening within your clinic. Um, Carly, this is Alicia, and I have one last thought that I wanted to share with you guys and with the clinics. Um, I am really excited about this work happening, and I would love to be a thought partner for any clinics or our policy team here who are interested in thinking about, kind of as you shared at the beginning, how we might explore social determinant issues as a kind of focal point to look at as we're developing our advocacy efforts um, and capacity. So if there are any CHCs who would be interested in thinking, you know, or, or doing some brainstorming with us to think about how that might lay out. I thought Virginia Garcia did a really fantastic job of sharing how they focused in on immigration status as a kind of upstream issue. So I'm available to help think through that if folks are interested. Um, I think much, many of you are going down this path anyway with us in different arenas, uh, for example, APCM. So would love to, to provide any support that would be helpful as you continue those efforts. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I think kind of highlighting that at the beginning was intentional to say, you know, if we're going to move upstream, this is bigger than just health care. Right. Um, and advocacy needs to be a really critical part of that. So we would value your expertise. Great. Okay. Thank you all for joining. We really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.